Baltimore. Charm City, also known as the City of First. Baltimore lays claim to the first black American boxing champion, Joe Gans, also known as the Old Master. Joe Gans, this gentleman right here. A lot of people don't know about him, and behind me you can see a cemetery. I'm at his graveyard, uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery, and right here at his site, um, it's right at the entrance, so it's very easy to find when you when you come in. It's um, Mount Auburn is right up the street from Raven Stadium. So if you take BW Parkway, like you're heading toward uh, the airport, you get off at Annapolis Road on the top of the hill, you'll find uh, the cemetery. It's a very old cemetery, but there's so many things about Joe that a lot of people don't know, such as what I mentioned, that he was the first black champion of any, black American champion of any sport, and he happened to be boxing uh, champion. Also, he also had the longest fight ever. He retained his title in Goldfield, Nevada in 1906 in a 42 round fight. Yes, 42 rounds. And he, returned, he uh, retained his title. With some of those earnings, he returned here in Baltimore. He opened up a hotel downtown. And behind me is a picture of the hotel. Very hard to find pictures of the hotel. It's called the Goldfields. And it was located where the main post office is downtown. Um, on East Lexington and Coven Street and he hired a young 19 year old UB Blake to be his piano player at that time in 1907 the building got knocked down in 1960 um, I do have a historical plaque there as well It's been my duty for about 10 years. I've been educating people about a boxer named Joe Gans. Joe, as you can see, my pit, my uh, shirt here that I had made. <laughs> I was selling these a while ago. I'm basically tapped out of them. Um, he was the first black American boxing champion. He also has the longest fight ever, which was in September the 3rd in 1906. Joe's uh, boxing reign was from 1902 to 1908. He was a lightweight champion. And uh, he had one of his biggest fights uh, at Goldfield, Nevada. It was a 42 round fight, and it's still the longest on record. You can look it up. And um, the year after, 1907, he opened a hotel. Matter of fact, it was October the 29th, 1907. He said it was a big gala that spilled out in the street. Behind me was where the hotel was. But unfortunately, the building was knocked down in 1960 to make way for the post office, the main post office here. Behind me is the uh, present day post office annex building. So I'm on East Lexington and Coven Street. Um, at that time, actually Coven Street, which um, runs right in front of me, was called Chestnut Street. And then later the name was uh, turned to um, uh, Coven Street. But anyway, at this hotel, he hired a young 19 year old, Yubi Blake, to be one of his piano players. And Yubi uh, wound up writing three rags. Uh, 
ragtime songs. One was called The Goldfield Rag. Um, unfortunately, Joe passed away at age 35 from tuberculosis in 1910. Uh, and then a few years after that, his wife wound up remarrying and they wound up selling the building. Now the building, uh, like I said, in 1960 was knocked down um, to become the post office here. But I'm gonna show you a picture. I've only seen two pictures of the hotel. And uh, I'm telling you, it seems like they just wanna erase Joe out of history. The one picture that I'm gonna show you is from 1947, which is on the plaque. I've, there's a plaque behind me that I wound up buying in 2010, which ironically was the same year, the 100th anniversary of Joe's passing. But I had it unveiled here in December of 2010. And it talks, this is the same type of um, plaque that you have on the side of a building if it was still around. Uh, and it tells you about the hotel and about Joe. This is a picture of boxer Joe Gans in case you've never seen Joe. And you can also go on, uh, you can Google him, and also on YouTube, there's a couple of his fights there. This is a picture of the hotel. I have a bigger picture. And there was another picture from 1955, or the only pictures that I've ever come across. And um, Joe wasn't just a, a sports athlete. He was a, a, a businessman, like I said, to put his money into uh, having a, a, a place like this. It was um, a hotel, and you get food and rest, nice restaurant. And uh, unfortunately... Later, like I said, in the 40s, the place became um, a grocery store at the bottom. This is a bigger picture of what it looked like, and it stood right <laughs> behind me. Um, but these were grocery stores that, at the end, you know, toward the end of um, its existence, and the hotel rooms were later boarding rooms. So that's what happened. Now, for what I understand, down in the basement, there were. Uh, it was a boxing gym. He wanted to teach little black kids, little boys, how to uh, box. But uh, it's very hard to find any pictures of this place. But um, anyway, this is the plaque here. And you see somebody, some idiot, used some sharp, hard sharpened uh, object to dent this. I have no idea why people want to vandalize things. But yeah, I paid for this back in 2010. But uh, um this is some history that they don't talk much about and especially a lot of people probably don't know this when you go past here you see the downtown post office and the post office annex building but you don't know the history that was here and like i said it opened in october the 29th 1907 it was a gala that spilled out into the street and uh he had his car here as well matter of fact he was one of the first black men in baltimore to own a car he bought a Masterson that he paid $5,555 for it. But uh, so much history about Joe that people don't uh, know about him. And um, he was quiet against racism, even you know during the time of dealing you know, with Jim Crow. And he's kind of forgotten. And it's been my mission that he doesn't get forgotten. And I've been trying to get a postal stamp. Unfortunately, again, he uh, uh, didn't make the list of... Uh, getting a stamp so i'm moving concentrating on some other things i'm hoping to get a bronze statue like they have at madison square garden of him and try to do that here in baltimore uh there have been two books written about him one called uh, joe gans the longest fight and then the other one is joe gans a biography so definitely check those out you can get those on amazon um or even ebay Hey, I'm Bill Gilday. I wrote this book, The Longest Fight. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a two-pronged title. It means uh, he had a 42-round fight, which is the longest fight in America uh, in the modern age. It was fought in 1906, and 
and uh, also uh, it's about discrimination. It's what it means to be a black person, a black boxer at the turn of the century. And as we know now, we have a long way to go. Joe Gans was from Baltimore. I'm from Baltimore. And I decided that it would be a perfect segue when I retired to, from the Washington Post to do Joe Gans. Uh, I looked for a, a person to do and uh, Gans, Gans was uh, that person. He, I finally discovered that there, there isn't, I, I, I don't think there is any other person in Baltimore that I would rather do. And uh, my hope is that a lot of people will come to recognize what a great athlete and what a great person Joe Gans was. He is in the Hall of Fame for a number of reasons. He fought at the 42 round fight, which he won. And it's problematical, but he might have had TB when he fought that fight. He certainly had tuberculosis when he fought the next two fights against Battling Nelson. Um, he invented, he invented certain punches. He was a defensive fighter and that is another reason he's in the Hall of Fame for his, for his uh, inventiveness. You can say that uh, John Unitas was or was not the greatest quarterback of all time. But one thing is certain, he invented certain ways. He invented the two-minute drill. So same with Gans. He invented certain punches. He had a, he had a, he had a great natural ability. And uh, he, he, he did go very, very slowly with white guys because he didn't want to embarrass them. Well, he, he definitely went slow with white guys. He didn't, not, he didn't knock them out in the first round, which he could have, but he carried them for a few rounds, then knocked them out. He didn't want to embarrass them. Uh, you could say um, a lot of Joe Gans's uh, way of living was similar to John Unitas. You can say that John Unitas was the best quarterback of all time. Some will say John or Joe Montana or others. But the, the problem, the problem is that is a person's opinion. What got John into the Hall of Fame and what got Joe into the Boxing Hall of Fame was the fact of what they did for their particular sport. They invented, they invented uh, things that hadn't been seen before, like the two-minute drill in the case of the Unitas, and in the case of Gans, uh, Joe had a, uh, he had natural ability, and he used his left hook uh, all, all hooks are left-handed, except by uh, southpaws. But he, he used his left hook uh, devastatingly, and uh, he was a defensive fighter, which African Americans at that time had to be. Sitting here next to Joe Gans' gravesite on a beautiful summer day in Baltimore, Maryland, at Mount Auburn Cemetery, leads me to want to read to you 
passage from the book. The Longest Fight, which I wrote. Joe Gans was, by virtue of the 32nd knockout of Frank Earn in Fort Erie, Pennsylvania, in Canada, became the first black American to win a title. Not only in boxing, he was a lightweight champion, in any sport. Here is the passage. As they neared Baltimore, Joe and Al Herford, his manager, Al was, men was mentioning what, what a tremendous showing Joe had made. Joe didn't say anything for a long moment. Then he said wistfully, yes, Mr. Herford. It sure is wonderful. But do you know what I'm thinking? And Herford said, what? That I'd give it all up, the money, the fuss, the championship, for just one thing. What's that? I asked. For a white boy's chance in the world. Joe wasn't going to be invited to the White House. Joe was wasn't even going to be recognized as the lightweight champion of the world in the white sections of Baltimore. Archie Moore, Mike Tyson, Benny Leonard, they all came here to the gravesite of Joe Gans to pay their respects. As well they should. And there should be more. There's a statue of Joe Gans in Madison Square Garden outside the restaurant. But most people don't know who that fighter is. It's Joe Gans. He used to be in the lobby and fighters would come into the garden and rub their hands against his fist and and the, the fist is worn slightly but that's how many fighters paid respects to Joe Gans. Uh, A.J. Liebling once said that boxing was in a valley but it would come again and that's how it is today. Boxing is in a valley but it will come again and it will Heavyweight champion of the world, the middleweight champion of the world, the lightweight champion of the world can all come here and pay their respects to Joe Gans because he made it famous.